In this episode of Cider Chat, I'll be speaking about how you can make cider at home this fall, 2020. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rio Wincaller and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This episode is going live the tail end of August 2020, and we're entering into the fall season, despite the fact that it is still summer everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, which means this is the season to be planning for making cider and how you could do that at home. I'll get into that straight away, but first, a wee bit of news out and about in Ciderville. It's been a busy week since I last posted an episode. Last week's episode was with Maxim. That was a part four of the four-part series with Russian cider makers. And I decided to finally venture out into the world further beyond the borders of my own town and county. And that meant I was going to be going out towards Boston, which allowed me to make a stop at Stormlong Cidery. And you'll be hearing that conversation coming up uh, very shortly in an uh, upcoming episode because I'm delving into this cider making piece. I thought it'd be really interesting for all of us to talk about cleaning with a commercial maker who scaled up from a barn setting into a much larger operation. So there's going to be a lot of tidbits there. That's a very deep dive, pretty technical, but we also talk about the home piece too. So this week's Basics of Cider Making, and next week we're going into cleaning. Uh, so fun stuff there. So that was that happened in the morning last Friday, and because I was about halfway to Boston, I decided to drive the rest of the way out to Boston and go to Arnold Arboretum. Now, I had gotten a tip back in February when I was in France and interviewing Arnold, who is who we call the Pope, the French Pope, uh, the French Pope of Sorbus Domestica. He is just an enthusiast beyond words, and he really got me into Sorbs because there's some really cool properties about them. You know, the wood was super hard and it was used for both presses for olive oil and cider. So the rest of the wood and press would be like maybe oak, but the actual screw for the press was made out of Sorbus Domestica, super hard wood. Uh, the history of it's just absolutely amazing. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to that conversation and I do recommend listening to it. He just gets you all charged up. And then there's other properties about sorbs too that are very, very interesting. Uh, one is that it is said to cure ill wine or cider. Now, I'm not sure how ill <laughs> the, the cider uh, can be and sorbs could help, but I have no idea. Um, but I'm going to maybe find out. We'll see. And then it could also be as uh, used as a substitute for sulfites, which could be a really game changer for people. Now, a lot to be discovered there. And I knew in the back of my mind that August is when the sorbs are typically green. And Arnold had really recommended that I get green sorbs from the tree. So that's what I set out to do. And I'm not sure if what I got was really ripe sorbs or green green sorbs. I'm thinking that they might be a little too ripe, but I still have a little baggy. And you could see exactly what I did. I head out to the Arboretum, found out that it was actually really kind of like more tightly controlled due to COVID. So that brought me on a little bit of a masquerade tour, trying to find my way around on this huge, giant, like parkland area where there's all these different specimens of plants and trees. And finding a particular tree at a site like that, you have a map. I had a map on my desktop. When I had my smartphone, I couldn't find it in the same way. So I just had to kind of register in my mind how to find it. I eventually did find it primarily because I knew what the leaves looked like on the tree. And that was the lifesaver. I was just my head up in the sky the whole time walking along on the path, looking for these very specific leaves that are 
the Sorbus domestica leaves. And I only knew that because I have Sorbus domestica growing here at home. I have a couple of trees that I am nurturing and growing from seed. Eventually found the tree, found all the sorbs, a lot of them on the ground and some clusters still up in the tree. It was a big tree. It was 95 years old. Uh, it said on the plate that it was from uh, Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic, and planted there. So we'll see. I'm, I'm on this little quest to discover what the sorbs are like. I bit into it and it was super astringent. Uh, it remind me a lot of like a peri pear in a way, and um, just for those of you who know some of the kind of big key makers in the world, uh, specifically like Eric Bordelais, Arnold turned him on to sorbs, and he then made uh, this product called Corm, which is C O R M E. That's another word for sorbus domestica. It's a Absolutely delicious. What a, a bouquet. What an exquisite, exquisite libation. So there you have it. That's what I spent my last week doing. And um, you could check out the adventures because I am now posting to the social media app called TikTok. So just look up at Cider Chat on TikTok and please follow along. Follow Cider Chat. That'll be a lot of fun. I'm going to have a little bit of fun. I don't know if I'm going to dance on TikTok like some people do, but you never know. I might have a couple of postings up there already as I'm learning that new medium and playing with video. So <laughs> that's my my what I did over the weekend thing. I hope that your weekend was as best as it could be. I know that there's a lot going on in the world right now, and it's just so important to keep focused and keep on loving it out there. Hi, Rhea. It's Carol B. Hillman. I want to welcome you and your friends to the farm in New Salem and to New Salem Cider. Come any day of the week, 10 to 5, and on the weekends, our cider garden is open, overlooking the Quabbin Reservoir and our 135-year-old trees, whose heirloom apples make up our hard cider. Even as the chill comes into the air, we have a fire pit to add warmth to your comfort. Hope to welcome you soon. Cheers and good health. Thank you so much, Carol B. Hillman, for sending in that perfect audio snapshot. Uh, it, it is just a thrill for me to think that this 90-plus-year-old took the time to send in that snapshot of what's happening there. And it is a spectacular location. It's actually in Massachusetts where I live, my area of Franklin County. It's an orchard that's always open during Franklin County Cider Days. Of course, this year we're not scaling at the same level that we have in the past due to COVID. But they're open every single day of the week, as she said, to uh, 10 to 5. And you get to like walk up to the barn and walk out into the orchard with a, a glass of cider in hand and check out these trees. Absolutely spectacular. It has what is known as apple pretzels. That was coined at this orchard. Uh, Brad, who is a pruner, has been doing the work there for over 30 years. And it's a way that he weaves in like the sucker branches and creates what looks like pretzels up in the tree. And they create bomber handholds for when you're like climbing into the tree to pick apples, but also you get cluster fruiting in these spots too. And I think it almost works as a way to support these really old trees. Uh, there's a cider maker there. You might know William Groda, who is a cider maker. He's been part of Cider Chat for a long time. Uh, maybe you've met him out at different cider festivals, a great guy, Boston based, and is making the cider there in their little cider house. And it's all fruit from the orchard. It's really a fantastic place. I hope you get to go visit and you'll probably see Carol 
walking about, and definitely go check out that orchard. Now, if you'd like to send in an audio snapshot too, it's super easy. I really recommend it. It's a great way to get your good cider news out to the public. Just record via your smartphone app like Carol did. And I know if she could do it in her 90s, I know you can too. <laughs> send in a audio snapshot, two minutes or less. Send it to me, Ria at ciderchat.com. And we'll post it on the podcast for you. Let's make cider at home. That is the topic for this here episode. And my goal is to help those of us out there who enjoy drinking cider, who always thought about, well, can I make something that is similar to the cider that I buy at a, a producer's farm stand cidery or something that I get from a store? Well, the short answer is yes, of course you can, you know, with a bit of work behind it, you can. But my goal here for this here episode is one to to start you off at a level that allows you to decide whether or not you want to go full on in it. And I could really only use my own experiences as an example for what I mean here. In that over the years of making cider, you can accumulate a lot of equipment. And that's cool if you have the space for it. But it might get a little overwhelming for anyone else living in your home or just for yourself. Uh, there's kind of like a, a syndrome, like it's a cider hoarder syndrome. You know, you got to have kegs, you got to have CO2, you got to have hoses, you got to have cleaning equipment, you got to have how many carboys? Well, you know, I've counting carboys in my own home. I probably have about 20 carboys in total. I got this one giant carboy. It's this, this is a glass container. It's 20 gallons alone in that one glass container. I, I mean, I couldn't turn it down. It was just so cool. You know, I've used it like once all these years. It came in handy for that one time, but I'm not going to be able to pick up a 20 gallon container in that way. Uh, even five gallon containers way back when was a lot for me to pick up. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I want to give you a little bit of advice here. One, to not jump in too deep into the rabbit hole until you know you want to go there. And at this point in time, when there's so much good cider to be had out in the stores or on the cider trails worldwide, maybe it's not necessarily an option that you have to choose for yourself. But with that said, I think there's a huge benefit in making cider in that it teaches you the process. It allows you to appreciate the apple and then have a greater understanding for what cider makers commercially are doing. Uh, for me personally, I love making a single varietal cider, uh, meaning that I'm going out in the the world and I see a, a beautiful apple tree laden with fruit. I don't know what kind of apples those are. I bite into it. It tastes kind of good. Maybe there's a little tannic structure. Uh, it has some complexity to it. And I think, oh, I want to make a cider with that and see what happens. And I won't mix anything else with it. And I'll just allow it to ferment out. And it provides me the ability to do a deep dive into that particular apple. Or conversely, maybe I do know what that variety is, uh, such as the Lady Apple uh, at Carol B. Hillman's farm, her orchard at New Salem, that we heard from just moments ago. Years ago, that was in 2017, I was able to pick all the apples off of the tree called Lady. And I fermented that cider out as a single varietal cider because I just wanted to know what that was like. And we're seeing this happening more and more at different locations worldwide where people do have a bevy of different varieties to work from. And they are producing single varietal ciders or a cider made with two different apples or, or pears, if you will. And a great example of that is the folks at Ross and Wye Cider and Perry Company in Ross and Wye in the UK. They have like over 80 plus different ciders to choose from. And a lot of them are very specific varietals. 
uh, one or two varieties or maybe just one alone. And it just is, it's like reason to move there. <laughs> Anyways, tip the glass to the Johnsons. In the U.S., I highly recommend checking out Abermile Cider Works for single varietal ciders. And they have a whole bunch to choose from. They make outstanding ciders. These are Southern Apple variety ciders, some of them. And it will, it really, really inform you. And the cool thing about that is that you just are able to then understand slowly but surely how other cider makers will say, well, let's blend that. If that's a good base apple, and I am working with another apple that, well, it's a good juice apple, but it doesn't have a lot of complexity. Now I know I could go to the Arkansas Black that's going to like have a huge tannin mouthfeel and really a lot of weight to it and throw that into the bunch too. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself because uh, I'm talking about blending. And for our purpose right now, for this year episode, we're not going to worry about that. We just want to make really simple cider at home. Walking to the orchards. At the minimum, you're going to need four things in order to make cider at home. Number one is apple juice. Now, if you don't live in a cider territory like I do in New England, where we have a lot of cider mills all over the place and you could go to those different farm stands and get a plastic jug of juice. Again, that's a one gallon supply of juice in a little plastic container. Then you might have to go to the grocery store and they might be bringing in juice from my perfect spot of Ciderville to yours. That juice is going to be a little bit different, but don't sweat it. You know, you're just going to do basic cider making. Uh, what I recommend, though, is you want to ferment juice that you like drinking. It's kind of tasty. It has some body to it. So if that's an option for you, then be a little selective if you have a couple juices on the shelf to choose from. If you don't have that, let's say you are in some territory in the world where you can't get really any kind of proper cider in terms of a nice cider blend from a cider mill or fresh pressed apple juice. You might be looking at canned apple juice that's been super pasteurized. You know, what the heck? Try it. Don't, I, I won't judge you for that. At least you'll get an understanding of the process of how cider is being made. So number one, you got to find your juice. So that's the first thing you want to start looking for right now, wherever you are. It's a fall. If you are in an area where there's apples and you can get a, a scene together where you go picking apples and you have a little cider press and you mill that all up and press your own apple juice. Ooh la la, you, you, are, you are there. In fact, you know, before I even started fermenting, cider myself at home. We used to just press apple juice every year on Thanksgiving and just be drinking that all day long while the turkey was cooking outside on the fire. So if you are in that kind of like scene where you get apple juice that way, this would be t the time to do it. <laughs> no doubt about it. So number one, get your juice. Dancing in the street. And Carol B. Hillman, who we heard from earlier at New Salem Hard Cider, that's a perfect example of a place that you go to and you could get fresh pressed apple juice to go besides hard cider. So most places like in the Europe and in the U.S., if they are an orchard-based cidery and have a tasting room, more often than not, you'll be able to get fresh pressed apple juice and some cider and cider in this case as hard cider it's been fermented right so get yourself a gallon of cider that's what we're looking at for this here episode which leads you to the second piece of equipment which is the jug so you could ferment everything right in that plastic jug typically it's going to be plastic rarely do we see big glass um, bottles, one gallon jug bottles, but it, it can happen. I know some of the big grocery chains do sell apple juice that way. And if that's all you could get, you're still okay. So number one is juice. 
Number two is a vessel. As long as it's a food grade vessel, and if they sold you the juice in that jug, you are good to go. So that's the two things there, juice and jug. And I need to add this because speaking as an American who lives in America, it is well known that a lot of people in the U.S. call fresh pressed apple juice cider. And then they call fermented apple juice hard cider. But everywhere in the world elsewhere, it's when it's fermented, it's called cider. So that just kind of screws it up and makes you feel like, well, what am I talking about? And specifically, if you go to New Salem Hard Cider and you ask for apple juice, Carol B. Hillman might look at you a little sideways because she does not call her fresh pressed apple juice anything other than cider. And then they call what they ferment hard cider. So I don't want to complicate it, but it's just kind of a funny note and, and it does make it a little wiggy, but you know, th- these are, these are small little roadblocks along the way. And if you are astute enough to listen to a podcast, I think you get it. So we got juice and jug. And now the third thing you're going to need is smelling all the blossoms, a stopper. Now, this is a rubber stopper that's going to fit on the top of that one gallon jug, and it needs to have a hole in it. And let me tell you, rubber stoppers come in many different diameters. So you're going to have to make sure, and this is probably most, you know, like, oh crap, now what I got to do? Wiggy little thing that you got to figure out here, but it's it's going to be super easy because I'm going to have a link in the show notes for a rubber stopper that you could get for your jug uh, and at least a location that you could ask the people, will this fit in a one gallon jug? And they'll say yes. Um, so it needs to have a hole. So juice, jug, and stopper. And the next piece of equipment is kicking it up our feet. An airlock. And right now, for the most part, they're all plastic. I have a couple super cool glass ones that were, again, more equipment that was given to me over time in my giant equipment stash. Uh, But most airlocks are going to be plastic and they have an, an opening on either end. One end will obviously go into the rubber stopper and the other end might have a little cap on it just to keep things clean. But the airlock is designed to be filled with water. And as the cider starts fermenting, the yeast produces CO2, carbon dioxide. And that allows the the CO2 to release and it kind of bubbles out of the airlock. You hear this sound which most people who are regular listeners to Cider Chat know that sound quite well. It's a, the little bubbling sound. It's just music to my ears at this time of year when everybody's making cider. So that's four things you need. Juice, jug, stopper, and airlock. Now it's time to make some cider. And we're going to start with that fresh pressed apple juice that you got at the cider mill or at the grocery store. You've kept it chilled. You kind of treat it like a gallon of milk. You don't leave it out in the warm heat. Otherwise, the milk starts turning and so will apple juice. In fact, the apple juice will begin to ferment. And if that happens, no sweat. You're just going to put an airlock on it. Uh, So we pull that jug out of the refrigerator and we're ready to make our juice into cider. And what we're going to begin with is creating a little bit of headspace in that jug. So pour yourself a cup of fresh pressed apple juice and you could drink that or cook with it or or do whatever you want with it at that moment. And that's going to provide you a bit of headspace. So as the juice begins to ferment, it will create some foam and that foam won't push up necessarily up to your, through your stopper and into your airlock. If you start seeing that happen, pour out a little bit more juice. It'll just save you the headache of having to clean the airlock afterwards. It's it's not a big deal if it happens. Uh, Don't sweat it. Uh, Sometimes when I'm making large batches of cider, for instance, when I've been fermenting out of my barrel, I have an oak barrel, 25-gallon barrel, 
I have a stopper, just like I'm talking about, with that hole in it, and I will put in a clean, sanitized tube, a clear plastic tube, food-grade tube, into the stopper going into the barrel, and the tube will go down to the floor and go into a, a like a glass, giant, like, gallon mason jar filled with water. Because as cider ferments, as it's, you know, turning from juice to cider, it has some, what's like a blow off. And that's the CO2 that the yeast is producing blowing off. But it could be so full in your vessel that there's foam also, and that will push through my tube. So this is something that brewers do and also fermenters. And uh, that would be I don't want to complicate it too much, but that is always an option. So you pour out a little bit of juice out of your one-gallon jug. You put your stopper on with your airlock that's filled with water. And you find a little spot that is not too hot. It's not freezing temperatures and allow it to ferment. And that's going to pretty much happen probably in like 24 or 48 hours, depending on what kind of apple juice you started with. Now, this is not going to make a ton of cider for you. In fact, as it ferments, what's going to happen is that cloudy apple juice that you originally had is going to start clarifying. And all the apple particles, the kind of cloudiness that makes it look like apple juice from the farm is going to drop to the bottom of your little vessel. Don't sweat that. Um, you know, you could even like stir it back in a little bit if you want to. That's what botanage is. And there's a lot of episodes uh, with Ryan Monkman talking about botanage. You could go to the Ask Ryan series and we, we talk about it there at great length. Uh, that's an option too. It's going to probably take you about two weeks or so for it to kind of ferment out. That's more than enough time for a one gallon jug of cider. And I recommend that you do taste it along the way because this is going to be a small batch. Um, in a month's time, you're going to have some cider. It's, it, it might be a little uh, spritzy, a little bit like, uh, like little spritzy, meaning like not sparkling bubbles, but a little spritzy. That means that it hasn't fully fermented out And when it's fully fermented out, it's going to be completely still and it'll be very dry. And that's a classic cider. And you've just fermented cider with the yeast that was in the juice already. We call that wild yeast. And you're good to go. I know many listeners out there in Ciderville know this is like so, so basic, but I really want you to encourage, if you are a a full-on cider maker, encourage people to try this gallon jug experiment. You know, throw them an airlock that you might have and just let people enjoy this because it's so much fun to make your own cider and just to see what that is like. So at the end of that like two-week period, if it's kind of slowed down, uh, just pour off that juice, you know, to the point that you like it into a another container. Leave the the sludge on the bottom, we call that the lees, that's spelled L-E-E-S. Uh, so some, some people save that, like myself, and I cook with that. I'm going to put it on some steak tonight that I'm grilling out on the old barbecue with some cider on the side. Uh, you could do that too, or you could just put it in the compost or, or down the drain. It'll be fine for a gallon jug. You're not going to have that much. And in the end, out of a gallon jug, you're just going to have, you know... <laughs> not even three quarters of a gallon of of cider. So it's just a small amount. And if this sparks you, if this feels like fun, then by all means, in short order, you could go online or go to your homebrew shop and get yourself a three-gallon carboy, a three-gallon glass carboy, or a five-gallon glass carboy, or even scale up even larger if you want. You could do food-grade buckets. It's the sky's the limit. And most commercial makers were folks making cider at home to begin with. But before you go that avenue, just check it out at this level and realize that all the producers in the world who are making cider commercially, there is someone out there picking the apples 
well, shoot, even before they pick the apples, tending to the orchard and pruning back the trees. It's a lot of work to bring that tree, that fruit to the finished product in the bottle. And that's something you might want to consider if you're thinking, God, I love this. I want to start, you know, I want to have an orchard now. I want to, you know, get a whole bunch of stainless steel veritable tanks and start producing cider. Before you go that route, just make yourself a gallon batch and say, well, you know, did you clean that airlock right away? Uh, Or did you kind of forget about it for a while? Uh, You know, in total, it's going to be like under $20 cost to make that little one gallon blend of wild apple juice into cider. And if it was totally fun, then keep on keeping on. And if you enjoyed it, but you thought, uh, there's a lot more to it, then keep on supporting all the wonderful commercial cider makers out there. When I come back, I'm going to make a recommendation of a book that you should check out at this level for cider making. The Big Book of Cider Making is now available, uh, or at least you could order it, and it's coming out in September, I guess. Uh, We've been waiting for this book for a while. I had the authors on the podcast. uh, That was a couple episodes back, episode 231. That is both Christopher and Kristen Shockey. They've written a number of books already, and this one, by far, is one of the most eloquent-looking cider making books I have seen. It takes you, as they say, uh, on the path where you choose your own adventure. So if you like a real dry cider, if you really like sparkling cider, or you want to add fruit into your cider and make it a fruit cider, they do all that. They, They provide really clear directions that aren't overwhelming. So that's a great, great book to check out. Uh, there'll be, again, links to that. And also, uh, for a more technical book, there is Claude Jacquelet's The New Cider Maker's Handbook. So, wow, aren't we lucky that there's so many resources? I mean, if you go back 20 years ago or even less, there there was, you, you were just winging it and hopefully seeking out cider makers willing to talk to you about that. And typically cider makers are, but you know, you might have to travel really, really far to do that. So we are living in the land of plenty these days, and now you can make your own cider. And of course, I also hope that you use this here podcast as a resource, because there's so many episodes now in the archives, over 236 episodes that you could tap into that go through a range of different steps and procedures that cider makers worldwide are doing to make fantastic libations for all of us. So that I know is a good resource. And uh, when I come back, I'm going to share something that just came in across my screen here from uh, somebody kind of speaking to that. Well, this note just came in from uh, Patreon saying that I have a new patron and he wrote me a little note. Uh, So let's see. It goes, Hi Rhea, I just joined your Patreon page and plan to be one for a while. I wanted to reach out and thank you. I started following your podcast after being introduced during the Beginner Cider Maker Q&A at Chicago CiderCon in February 2019. Oh, that was a great CiderCon. Oh, yeah. And I was actually moderating that panel discussion with some really top quality commercial makers And I posted that actually on Cider Chat. So I'll put a link in the show notes for other people to hear that too. Uh, Cool, cool meetup, Sean. Uh, He goes on with, as an avid home cider maker since 2014, I could never get enough info. Once I got back from that conference, I started listening to your podcast every time I was in the car. It says that he puts puts on about 30,000 miles per year on his per car. So a lot of time for podcasts. Oh, oh, I am. I love that. Anyways, he continues with, I started at episode one and finally caught up to current episodes as of December, 2019. (laughs) The information from your interviews has been both enlightening and entertaining and helped me to create better ciders. I'm planning on opening a cidery in the future, although this may be a long way off due to finances. 
And he says, I'd love to send a bottle your way to see what you think. Cheers to you for all that you do. Signed, Sean Blaze. Wow, Sean, that is awesome. I love it. I'll send you a note back with my address so you could send that bottle of cider because I'd love to see what you're doing. I'm super stoked that you must have come to CiderCon as an enthusiast and you have that vision towards the future. So you know all about what I'm talking about of uh, cider making in the jug and kind of slowly scaling up from there. Right on. And a big tip of the glass to you for becoming a patron. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And you too can become a patron too by just going to the Cider Chat Patreon page. That's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And another tip of the glass goes out to Alan Supernot. He is a Massachusetts resident. He's an orchardist and farmer and contacted me this summer saying, Rhea, I'd like to make a donation to Cider Chat. I want to do it old school way, uh, which means that he wanted to send a check versus doing it like Patreon, uh, which, you know, it's tapping into your credit card, right? And I was like, dude, yeah, I totally get that. I mean, that's how I actually ran the New England Cider Tour. People had to do it old school and send in a check. And he did. And wow, you know, Alan, thank you. Thank you and all the folks out there who are supporting this podcast, uh, people who tap into the PayPal or Patreon or send a check my way or, or just send an email and say thank you. Uh, it means a lot to me. And I feel so connected during a time when it's so easy to be isolated, to be able to share these audio snapshots with makers. Um, wow, it is tremendous. So thank you to all the patrons. And thanks to you too, Ciderville, for keeping me inspired and always giving me a reason to raise my glass. With that, I leave you here. This is Rio Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. <laughs>